All right. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, an open source code that has uh, been developed over the last uh, almost two years now uh, through the computational infrastructure for geodynamics at UC Davis um, by myself and the Geodynamo Working Group, which includes uh, John Arnaud, uh, Ben Brown, Bruce Buffett, myself, Gary Glatzmeyer, Lorraine Huang, Eric Hyen, Louise Kellogg, Hiro Matsui, Peter Olson, and Sabine Stanley. So if you find anything wrong with my talk, just email one of them. <laughs> um, but what I'd like to talk about is a code which we've, we've now named Rayleigh, uh, just so that you know it has something to do with convection. And it is, has been developed for convection in a sphere for rotating stratified MHD convection. And um, I meant to put there that this is under the analastic or Boussinesque approximations right now. But what I'm going to talk about is a bit more general than which um, sort of uh, uh, incompressible or weakly incompressible approximation we're working in. Um, so the code is spectral. It uses spherical harmonics uh, in the horizontal. And then either Chebyshev polynomials or a fourth order finite difference um, approach in the radial direction. And it's highly scalable, and I'll talk a little bit about what that means. And I've scaled it out to about 132,000 cores. Um, the code is open source, or about to be, I should say. Um, so sometime around February or March. But before I go on, because when this light gets yellow, I'm either going to go really fast or really slow, and I don't want to miss my conclusion slide. Um, this code scales over, over many decades, so you can, you can run um, an incompressible system or an analastic system with a pseudo-spectral approach. And for problems that have sort of an L max of 2048, you can easily get out to about 2 times 10 to the 17 cores, which is 131,072. Uh, but for smaller problems, like 1024 cubed, um, you can scale efficiently out to about 64,000 cores. The, uh, the blue lines here are magnetic cases, and the black lines are um, non-magnetic cases. And this scaling data is from Mira uh, Blue Gene Q at Argon. Um, if you would like to kind of play around with this before it's officially released, feel free to email me, or else go to CIG's webpage and contact someone there. Or alternatively, if you know anyone in the working group on the previous slide, just contact them and they'll get in touch with me. So what I'd like to talk about is how this thing scales like this, and then I'll show a little bit of what it can do. Um, so this is kind of a conceptual view of a pseudo-spectral approach. And the idea is that when you're, you're running a calculation, you're kind of working in different configuration spaces. You have what I refer to as the spectral configuration, where everything is represented by its spherical harmonic degree or the, the order of the Chebyshev polynomial. Um, and that's usually where you evaluate the linear terms, you do the time stepping, you do the Poisson solve there. And then there's physical space where you compute the nonlinear terms. And everything here is represented in its physical space coordinates. And then you have these hybrid configurations where you can move back and forth between the two spaces along one of the coordinate axes. And this is where you do transforms and derivatives. Now, to carry out the calculation, so to evolve something for one time step, you have to move between these spaces. And that means that you have to carry out transforms. And so those can be computationally expensive. You're, you're doing operations that are order n squared or n log n. I guess really I should say n cubed there. So I'm referring to matrix, matrix multiplies. Um, and these are expensive, but they're also accurate. And so if you're interested in the accuracy, then usually the expense is worth it to you. Um, the real problem, though, is that also as you move between these spaces and you carry out transforms, you're usually carrying out a transpose, so an MPI all to all operation. And that can limit the scalability. So what I mean is that by scalability, I'm actually referring to strong scalability. So this is where we keep the problem size fixed, and we try to throw more cores at the problem in hopes that the time goes down linearly with the number of cores that we add. And so in an ideal world, if we were to plot the log time of the calculation versus the log of the number of cores, we'd get a straight line. Now, if we're doing something like a finite difference method or a finite volume method, You'll trace this line for several decades and eventually start to roll off, depending on your problem size, the efficiency of your approach, yada, yada, yada. But this works very well because during each time step, a process only has to communicate with a couple of other processes. However, for spectral methods, which involve global communication, 
you find that you roll off of this ideal scaling curve much more quickly. And this is really the problem. And so no matter what you do with a global code, you'll never run as well as one of these finite volume, finite difference codes. So the name of the game here is really mitigation. How do we mitigate this roll off effect so that we can stretch this curve down a little bit further? <coughs> And so what I'd like to do is just ask a simple question, and this is, how long should an all-to-all -all take? So the time for an all-to-all, -all, so global communication between a group of processors, is just, you can break it down into the initiation time, so the time to get somebody on the telephone, and then the transmission time, the time to actually tell them what you have to tell them. And so I'd like to think about this in terms of four variables. So the local problem size P, this is how many grid points you have on your process. The number of MPI ranks, N. The time to initiate a single message, I, and the bandwidth, B. So the bandwidth is how much data can you send per second. So if we ask ourselves what the transmission time is, well, first of all, we're sending N messages. And each of those messages is just the problem size divided by the number of processors. And then, of course, we divide by the bandwidth to convert that to a time. And so the funny thing about this is that it doesn't matter how many cores you throw at this, the transmission time is always constant. And so this is not really a problem. So when we say that spectral methods have a lot of communication and that causes problems, we're not saying that the time to transmit the data is the problem. However, if we think about the initiation time, well, that's just the number of cores times the time to initiate a single message. And that grows linearly with the number of cores we throw at the problem. And so the solution here is to try to limit the message count. And so in this code, what we've done is we've taken two approaches to actually limiting the number of messages that have been sent. And they're very simple things to do. Um, they're more simple if you build the thing from scratch. It's a bit of a pain to take an existing code, but you can do it. Um, and so I'll just talk about them briefly. So. One thing that's done pretty commonly in um, not just spectral methods, but any, any parallelization uh, strategy is to use what's a one, what called a 1D domain decomposition. And so in a spectral method, what this means is that every time step, you're performing one or many large all-to-alls across all the processes in your problem. And so the time to do each of those all-to-alls is just given by the equation we just used. However, if you use a 2D domain decomposition, this allows you to do something else. You can, ba you're ba you can basically do a very simple tree algorithm for your all-to-alls. So in, to perform the same operation, I might do transposes across each row, collect the data, and then redistribute it across each column. And so when I do that, I find that the transmission time is doubled, but that I've beat down the message initi initiation time by the square root of n. So we send more data but we also send fewer messages. And what I'll say without qualifying it, I, I won't show anything to prove it, it's just generally the message count is going to be the problem and not the amount of data you're sending around. Um, now, 2D domain, 2D domain decompositions are also not that uncommon because when you do this, this usually allows you to use more cores. Um, for instance, if you, if you have one radio level per process, as a lot of people do with 1D domain decompositions, you may be limited by the number of radial points you have. But in a 2D domain decomposition, you can, <clears throat> you're limited by the number of radial points times, say, the number of points in theta that you have. The other approach is that you can actually limit the number of transposes you do per time step. And so to, to think about this, think about if you want to compute the entropy advection term, or the temperature advection term. So you're in spectral space, and you have three components of the entropy gradient and three components of the velocity. And you need to compute the dot product of those things. Well, the obvious approach is to take each of these variables and independently transpose it, and then transform it, and get it to physical space. So when you do this, you carry out six transposes. And so the time is just six times the, the formula from before. Six times the transmission time, six times the initiation time. An alternative approach, though, is to pack these variables into a single buffer. So you place each field in a buffer, and you transpose that buffer all at once. 
And what happens is that the transmission time doesn't change, but the message time goes down. So <clears throat> just for a, a kind of quick idea of how many fields you're probably transposing in an MHD calculation, you'd be performing about 26 transposes uh, per time step just across process rows. And so if you pack things like this, you beat down your message initiation time by about a factor of 26. So what does the performance look like if you build a code based off of just these two ideas? I have the scaling plot I've already shown you. And then, because it's a little hard to see on the log-log plot, I've also plotted the parallel efficiency. So for a magnetic case, at sort of the 2048 cubed um, size, which is this upper blue line, um, on this blue gene machine, we can maintain about 80% efficiency out to 10 to the fifth cores. And then you can see some other values here. For instance, even on the uh, 1024 cubed cases, we're maintaining above 70% um, efficiency for magnetic cases. So what do you do if you have a code that works really well? <laughs> well, first you start writing computing time proposals. But in the meantime, you can do some very quick parameter studies because suddenly you can take very small problems, like 128 cubed, and run those very, very rapidly and do many of those in a very short amount of time. You can also do some nice, quick viz runs. And then you can do really big things. But before you do those, you have to go back to number one. This is just an example of something I did um, actually with a different code, with the ASH code, when I applied these principles to that code. Um, and so I got kind of antsy over Christmas vacation. I was sleeping in my parents' attic in North Carolina. And I said, well, maybe I'll do a parameter space study. Strange thing to do at Christmas, I know. But <coughs> I was able to do, in about a week, um, 17 different simulations of a solar convection zone. And these ranged from sort of 256 cubed collocation points to 1024 cubed. The time steps are here. Um, but you kind of get the idea. You can do things very quickly. Um, you know, it's useful to be able to run small cases very quickly. This is an example of a viz run that I was able to do in about uh, four hours on NASA Pleiades with Westmere cores. This is Boussinesque convection in the geometry of the Earth's core but it's not rotating. Um, and what you're seeing are only the warm thermal plumes coming off of the inner core. I've rendered the cool plumes invisible. Um, this has a Prandtl number of one and a Rayleigh number of about 10 to the seven. Um, and so it's, it's very nice when you can actually look, I would say, at what your simulations are doing. In fact, it took me a lot more time to move the data over um, than it did to, to, to do the run. This is another example I'll come back to in a second, but since I have just a minute left, I'd like to say uh, one more thing. Um, so big calculations aren't cheap. The fact that you scale well doesn't mean that anything has become cheaper. It just means you're able to spend more money. <laughs> um, and so if you were to say, well, I'd like to evolve a simulation of a certain size for a million time steps, what might it cost? And you find that these big simulations, you're starting to hit sort of the 100 million hour mark. And a million time steps probably isn't enough when you're at the resolution that you're at. Um, and so <clears throat> I would say that while it's very nice to have these sorts of tools, it's also a really good idea for us to work together to figure out what are the most efficient algorithms in the serial configuration. So for that, I would like to point you to uh, Hiro Matsui's poster where uh, we have a number of codes contributing to an effort where we're looking at the timings of these individual pieces of the computation. Um, <clears throat> and then also, I think it's worthwhile to think about how we can collaborate and write uh, computing proposals together. And so the working group was able to just successfully um, get uh, in time on insight, so about 300 million hours spread over three years. And we're going to look at uh, Earth, Jupiter, and the Sun. And I've got a guy standing behind me, so I'll just play a movie for one second. This is a rotating simulation with uh, parameters that were indicated on the other slide. So the, the warm stuff is red and the cool stuff is violet. Thank you. Time for one quick question. Oh, I do have one question. Yeah. Andy. Yeah. 
so the if you were to think of the oh sorry if you were to think of the the serial piece of the algorithms the the methods are very similar to uh, Gary Glatzmeier's 1984 paper uh, the parallelization is some amalgam of what he has done with Tom Clooney what Tom Clooney subsequently did with the ash code and then what I did with the ash code after Tom <laughs> so yep okay thanks again <laughs>